Welcome to Facing the Canon, and I am delighted that my guest is my friend Matt Redman. in St Andrew's Church yes. in Chorley Wood and this is a very special place for you. Massively special, yeah. I haven't been here for a while as well so it's a great day being back. I came to church here from a real young age and uh, my dad was, his funeral was here. I got married here, um, got baptised here and uh, I was on staff here and leading worship here. So wow, I spent yeah. a lot of time in this room, a lot of Sunday afternoons on my own panicking about what songs to do that night, <laughs> stuff like that, so. Lots of fond memories. Yeah. So, do you, you lived in Chorley Wood? Uh, yes, from about the age of two. And you went to school here? Yeah, just up the road. And uh, g growing up, what was that like? Um, a bit of a mixed bag, I think. Uh, you know, uh, we actually started coming to the church because me and my brother, all our mates went and my mum and dad weren't Christians and so we dragged them along here because our friends went here and we wanted to go and they became Christians which is wonderful and um, but then um, I had kind of pretty carefree childhood up, up until about the age of seven and then at the age of seven uh, one shocking day uh, got home from school and was told that my uh, dad had died and um, it's very shocking news at the time, obviously. Sure. Uh, and a little while later, I found out he'd actually taken his own life. So in some ways, that, that um, meant for some more questions. You know, was it anything to do with me or us? And, you know, what's that all about? Why would someone do that? And, and um, so a lot of questions kind of flying around. But um, I was really glad that I was already kind of planted here. You know, I remember even as a... As a um, I don't know, eight, nine years old, ten years old, I would, even when my family weren't coming to church, maybe people were ill or something, I would make sure I got down here and walked down here myself. Yeah. You know, I just um, thrived growing up here and uh, I can't remember a time I didn't talk to God, I didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't interested um, in Him. And you know, uh, it's, it's kind of great timing, um, for me because when I was 10 years old I fully committed my life to him. I was actually at a Lewis Palau meeting in QPR football stadium. God, I remember those meetings. Yeah, yeah a few people there. What, was that QPR a... fans? <laughs> yeah, probably not. Did, uh, a, did a group of people from here go? Yeah, there was a load of people uh, here and I think, um, and I, think um, I must have heard most things he said before but I don't think I'd heard them all together this kind of the gospel being present, presented in that way and like a, some kind of call to response. So I responded that night, mm. and, you know, that I'd say, you know, it's the night I became a Christian. And, uh, you know, the really nice thing is I get to do a few things with him these days. Oh, isn't that great? Yeah, and, uh, and uh, over in America particularly. And, um, and uh, so well, one time... you must have been encouraged when you well, told him. Well, it's wonderful because he, he said, you know, some real sweet things. And yeah. he, he said, you know, I guess that makes me your father in the faith, you, you know, and... Uh, and so my daughter was with me last time I was there and she goes, so, he goes, so I guess that makes me your, your grandfather in the faith. And she doesn't have a grandfather, so that was oh, kind of cool. Oh, that's really nice. But uh, a really nice thing is that I, I always uh, when I tell a story. I remember him saying that God is your father in, the, in his message that night. And so they went away and found the footage. And so, of, uh, so they made a little video of my testimony. Oh. And, I, and I'm saying that. And then I didn't know they found the actual footage of him saying that. So that was nice because... You know, you remember things, and it, it was nice to remember exactly how it, yeah. how it happened. But anyway... Um, so then your faith became real and yeah, alive. Yeah, it was becoming really real. And um, just... Um, but then another kind of crazy turn. Um, you know, my mum had remarried, and uh, I don't really want to go into the details, but, you know, the guy she remarried abused our trust as a family in a major way, and it was, it was a crazy time uh, for me. 
but it propelled me towards God. I think those times that either you make a decision, don't you have a choice to make? Do I believe that in God? You know, do I believe he's good? Do I believe he's in control? There's some big decisions. I'm sure at that age I couldn't, you know, verbalise that. But I know that kind of uh, tension, struggle, those questions are going on inside me. And it just propelled yeah. me towards him. I think I knew enough about him, even at that young age. That's what I mean about so great yeah, being sure. planted here so early because I knew so much about him at that young age that I knew enough to know I don't get this, I don't understand a little bit of it even, but one thing I do understand, I know God's good, I know he's real, I know Jesus is for me and he's with me, and I don't know, somehow I had faith to believe he had a plan for me. And, and you, did you, you felt that even during those abusive years? Yeah, I felt like... Um, <laughs> I don't remember a time think e even in the craziness of that, all those moments, I don't remember a time thinking, I don't believe in God, or, you know, I, d I don't even, um, I was angry at what was happening, but I don't know, I was particularly angry with him, I was, he was my only hope, I felt like, and I was trusting him, and yes. reading the Bible and thinking, well, he, it says in here, God's a father to the fatherless, and uh, so, you know, and it's all these, you know, I remember one psalm I used to, read a lot was Psalm 121, I lift my eyes to the yeah. hills, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And that was a big psalm to me, I'd be in that a lot. And um, so... So you started coming here to, uh, you were to the church, your, your uh, youth leader yes. was uh, Mike Pilavacci, who's here, in, yes. here tonight. Yes, he's uh, was still he doing good, youth work, I He's hear. still doing youth yeah. work, I know. <laughs> Has, has oh, yeah. he got his bus pass? I don't know. <laughs> Not He's, yet. Uh, yeah. Was he a good youth leader? He was brilliant. He's the best. The, uh, I mean, seriously, because I, I, you know, I was going through all this crazy stuff, and um, you know, it took, it took. Uh, I wasn't going to tell anyone what I was going through, so it took a great youth leader to kind of hear from God or perceive something weird was going on with me. Then second step to get me to, you know, talk about that stuff, and he walked me through a lot of that. And I think, yeah. um, but here's a really cool thing. I mean, this church was great anyway for, you know, uh, Bishop David Pitch is leading it, and uh, just it was a great environment for young people to grow up in. But you know, particularly being in the youth group with Mike, it wasn't just um, okay. Let's try and get you through this stuff, and maybe you could be healed up a little. But it was like, now you're going to run, you know, and uh, he's the one who encouraged me to get, you know, writing and leading. And, uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of emotional even being here sure. tonight because I've been, I've been walking the streets today around, I haven't been here for ages, and just grateful to God, you know. It um, says in the Bible, God, um, Joseph calls his son Ephraim, and he says, because the Lord may be fruitful in the land of my suffering. Yeah. And I just, you know, feel that. Sure. So, God, how did you get into, like, worship? And well, it's the, how did it was all the, that happen? It was a big hairy Greek again, you know? He, uh, <laughs> he, he, uh, I'll tell you what happened, actually. I, I'd started playing the guitar on this kind of sneaky at home because I didn't really want to lead. I just wanted, I loved what was going on in, in the, the church and these songs. I just thought I'd love to play some of these at home, so... I was doing that, and I, I didn't really, honestly, didn't think, oh, I'm going to be a worship leader. And uh, I think we were, we were at the Greenbelt Festival, the youth group, and I apparently had my headphones on. I was listening to some U2, and I was singing along, and Mike heard that. And um, now, Mike doesn't strike you as the most obvious kind of musical talent scout. You know, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think there's some people are musical, some people are not musical. He, yes, he's kind of sub musical. Right. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so he, uh, you know, but he, he apparently thought I could sing, and then we, we, we talked a lot about worship. That was a big deal. We were all on a journey together, and particularly we'd spend a lot of time uh, through years talking about these things. So he, so he actually got me into leading worship. Um, in fact, I remember I was saying, no, I don't want to do it. And there was one time even like a, these elaborate hoaxes where uh, the other worship, the worship leader in the, in the church would drive up I think we were standing in the car park here or something. He drove up and said, oh, Mark, I can't lead tonight. My guitar's broken. Kind of drove off. And I just saw him smirk before he 
before he accelerated away. And I thought, oh, okay, here we go, it's setting me up. Yeah. So I was, you know, I wasn't. And, and the first time I led, I led there as a redeemer. And we didn't even get to verse three. I, we didn't stand in glory, you know, because I, I was like, okay, I'm done with this. This is, <laughs> this is, you know, it's a lot to compute, you know, singing and playing. And, but um, so he, Mike really encouraged me into that. This was a great environment to grow. And, um, but I definitely loved what happened when the people of God in the presence of God pouring out the praises of God. Yes. And there's something that got in me really young and I, I, I could never shake it. I would never want to. There's a dynamic. You know, people can get in a room and sing and that happens in pubs and clubs and venues and all sorts of environments all over the world, all different sorts of cultures. But there's something about the worshipping church. There's something about the people of God immersed in the presence of God, pouring their hearts out with the praises of God. That You just can't replicate that. There's no way to... Um, there's nothing that really compares with that. There's a dynamic that happens. And uh, so I think that's why, it, you know, it, I love music. I love messing about with melodies and chords. I particularly love messing about with words, but there's something about that, that dynamic that really uh, drew me in and kind of captivated me. Just, just clarify for us a little bit about worship. I mean, it's been said yeah, now. Yeah, because you're an evangelist. So I'm you, an evangelist, so that's right. I do need educating, yeah. but... Um, <laughs> Right, it's been said, uh, you know, about ha has God got a bit of an identity problem that he <laughs> requires us to keep on saying to him how good he is? That's a very interesting question. I mean, I think the thing is, <laughs> you know, the, the short answer, if, if, if God is God, then it's, it's the only thing that can happen is that he would be deserving of worship. And, it, and it's actually the beautiful thing is in Christianity is the best thing for us as well, you know, to, to look towards him, to... Um, to walk towards him, to throw yourself down before him, to surrender to him, to become captivated by who he is, the glory and the grace and the wonder of who he is. That's the very best thing that can happen for you. And that's, um, and, and that's the very fitting right thing. If he's God, then what else should happen? I don't think he, we'd want a God who yeah. try to def deflect praise, you know. Or, um, yeah. And uh, you're right, in the, in the Bible, you know, God's, he's very clear about who he is. I'm the Lord and there is no other. And I'm not going to share my praise with anyone else. And I think in our kind of PCH, you know, particularly yeah. our minds thinking that, well, yeah. that doesn't, that's right. It seems like arrogant, but he's God, you know, and that's, he's made us. We're designed to, um, to uh, uh, worship him. Yeah. And, 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 and what I love is, you know, um, one, one of the nice kind of uh, liturgy things is uh, to, to, we're called to worship God and enjoy him forever. And enjoy him And forever. I think those two things Absolutely. go side by side. Yeah. Now, um, when we get to heaven, Matt, yeah. okay. Me and you or everyone? Yeah, you know. and me. Yeah. <laughs> when we get to heaven, okay, we're going to worship God for eternity. Yeah. Yeah. But when we get to heaven, we're not going to evangelize. Yeah. Right. So, so that kind of makes what I do. No. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just so, I'm so I'm just, so do you think we should cut down on the worship while we're here on earth <laughs> and up the evangelism? Oh. Because, you I know, think the two flow pretty beautifully together. You know, they're, they're uh, I'm not gonna let you finish then. So no, but go on, go on, um, um, let's hear your point well, of view. Well, I think they're just, they're just, John Piper says some great stuff in his book, Let the Nations Be Glad. He says, worship is both the fuel and the goal of missions. So uh, it's, it's what propels us out there in the first place, because we love God, we care about the honor of his name, and, uh, but at the same way, it's what's meant to happen. The, it, the result of mission is there's meant to be more worshipers and better worship. So of him so uh sure but so they kind of tied together right? yes but worship uh, uh is an expression of the, of the fact that we are concerned about the glory of god yeah but how can you be concerned about the glory of god and be unconcerned that millions of people are perishing i don't think you can no no but but you know, you put on a worship conference, people go. You put on an evangelism conference, no one turns no, that's up. No, that's just your ones. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, but I, wouldn't you agree, I'm though, joking. Matt? Wouldn't you agree that, that people are more open to worshipping or going to worship things than they would be engaging with people who are outside of the church? I definitely agree that the uh, I can, that human condition tends towards being a bit more inward looking and thinking about self more. And so I think uh, 
you know, I, th I think definitely one thing that switches when you become a Christian, when you become a worshiper of Jesus, is men are propel you to looking outward and yeah. going outward. You can't, I agree, you can't really have the, no. the heart of God for yourself and not have it for other people. That's part of the thing, you know, and, and part of loving him is loving other people. There's all, all that stuff. Um, I think, you know, there's been a big wake up call in, in the church. I think, you know, it used to be like worships over here, missions over here. Yeah. I think we're realizing these two things go very much alongside and, and um, but I definitely, I totally agree with your point that sometimes we're a bit too happy parting away in, in our church worship services when there's a whole lot of people outside yeah. and who, uh, but I don't think you should do away with that stuff because there's something, yeah. like I say, beautiful about the people of God coming together and making, being very intent on glorifying the name of God together Absolutely. And, and this, that's one of our distinctions sure. in the church. But like you say, we've got a complete the integrity of our worship by getting out there and, and speaking of him and Absolutely. shining him to others, yeah. But, what, you know, well, I mean, we, we agree, Matt, that, you know, worship and witness have got to go together. Yeah. Um, and uh, back in 1993, uh, Mike Plavacci uh, pioneered Soul Survivor uh, with you uh, as a lead worshipper and it's just remarkable uh, how Soul Survivor, through worship, the presence of God and the proclamation of the gospel has, has brought thousands of people to Christ. Amazing. And you've been involved in those festivals, you know, as I have been. Yeah, it's been um, amazing to see that, what God's done there and just the, I think the just growth year after year after year. And even hearing like this year, you know, it's just... Um, so many people, people in the hundreds and hundreds are becoming Christians. Yeah. And it's just amazing. It is amazing. Yeah. I know. Have you uh, heard the story about the, uh, this farmer who went to the big farming conference? And he was from a very rural community. And uh, he'd, yeah. never, he'd never been to the capital city before. And while he was at this farming conference, he got the opportunity to go to this mega church. Anyway, he gets back and his wife Martha says, oh, you know, you went to the church, how was the church? And he says, well, Martha, uh, they, they don't sing hymns, they sing choruses. And she goes, choruses? Well, what, what do you mean? And he says, well, Martha, if I said to you, Martha, the cows are in the corn, well, that would be like a hymn. But if I said to you, Martha, 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 the cows, the cows, the cows, the cows, the cows, the black cows, the black cows, the black cows, the black cows are in the corn, are in the corn, are in the corn, are in the corn, are in the corn. Well, that would be a chorus. Now, why is it, Matt, that, you know, sometimes, you know, I'm there in the worship service, I think, has the needle got stuck in the record? Why? You know, and maybe that's why God's saying, sing me a new song. <laughs> that's very good. Why, 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 do, why do worship leaders milk it? Well, I mean, to give you the biblical answer. Oh, yeah, I want the biblical answer. <laughs> Go on. You know, uh, there's a psalm like Psalm 136. Yeah. You know, it says like 26 times. There's this little refrain keeps coming. His love endures forever. So we sing something. So there's nothing inherently wrong with a refrain, but I agree with you. There are times where we don't need, seem to know how to stop the song and it keeps going round and round. That's definitely a problem. But, you know, the, I think the reason we're writing in this style is just a, a, a desire to be contemporary because that is the, that's the kind of um, substance and style of how so many contemporary songs are written. They have a refrain have a repeatable part i think it's a, actually a great congregational device because you know a lot of the old hymns what i, I love how much theology mm. and the poetry of them if i could say one thing i wish some of them had more it would be that little device what we would call a hook something that keeps coming back it's, once you know it you know it forever and you, and you you know uh, so i like that about the style of the songs you know the, this chorus thing this repeatable aspect to it but you're right We'd well, what be about very guilty of uh, going on far too long with our songs sometimes. Yeah, maybe cut it down a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah. now, why well, does while it we're have talking to about be? That, all right, while we're talking about why that. Why is the worship time like 30 minutes and the talk's like 55? <laughs> you know, it's like... You, okay. I mean, why, while, while we're talking about that, 
why is it that when I have to get up to speak at meetings, uh, there's nowhere for me to stand because all the worship group have taken the whole stage? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, I've got nowhere to stand. Yeah. You know, it's a balance, isn't it, between, between Just the two. Just a song get it over with. I know, let's do that. <laughs> let's have a handshake. <laughs> no, now, why, why is music so loud today? I mean, <laughs> is God deaf? <laughs> I mean, honestly, Mate. there's something about a lot of the conferences I speak at. It's like, it's so loud, I get a headache. Mate, do you know, I think it's Tozy said, the people of God have always been a little bit noisy. I like that. It's Can true. we not tone it down a little bit? <laughs> is this a thought you were having just in the mo recent years, the last couple of years? Or? <laughs> <laughs> is it, is it? <laughs> yeah, recent. <laughs> okay, we'll talk about after. We'll talk about that afterwards. I've got some, I've got yeah. some thoughts about that. All right. Yeah. Matt, t t tell us a little bit about, um, you know, how did you start writing songs? How did, you know, what, what was yeah. the first song that you wrote? Uh, it was called There's a Sound of Singing, and it was with a guy who played guitar with us yeah. called Paul Donnelly and then uh, very shortly after I wrote a little song which kind of sounds like a country song called I've Got a Love Song in My Heart and uh, very deep theology in the chorus Mike you always used to point out la 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, yeah and uh, you know my ultimate thing is try and write a song that's simple but not shallow yes so I think it's something nice in not having to compute tons of stuff sometimes yeah. and just you know, you can have a really sure. a gem of a truth. It doesn't have to be complicated necessarily. Yes, yeah, simple I, but yeah. not simplistic. I'm trying to think of a song being like a, a chapel and a classroom. Uh, you know, it, it can be a classroom. It can teach you, inform you, remind you. It can tell you something about God. But it has to have that chapel element as well, giving you a moment to uh, respond to that, what you think about that, um, it's giving you some space to devote yourself to God yeah. like, a, like a chapel. So uh, that's the aim. and. Yeah, started out, I guess I've written a couple of hundred songs. It's such a learning process. I have no idea. Did you write songs that, I mean, you didn't actually tell anyone about? Were you just oh, writing? Oh, yeah. There's yeah. been tons that have gone in the bin. Or I, what I learned pretty early on is I'm not actually a very good judge of what's good or not. And uh, that, that's with my own yeah. stuff and actually other people's as well. Like we, me and Mike, we were um, obviously at Soul Survivor Watford, Tim Hughes. Of course. That, you know, Here I Am to Worship, yeah. at one point, uh, it, it was the most sung song in the world in the church worldwide. And Tim wrote that, and he, I was the first person he played it to. And he sung it to me, and I said, yeah, it's quite good, it's a bit hymny, it's not as good as some of your, your others. <laughs> and um, so on the strength of that, he didn't yeah. play it for ages. Then a few months later, Mike said, have you got any other songs? And Tim said, I've got this thing, he played it. Mike's like, that's the best thing you've ever written, that's amazing, You're like, why didn't you tell me about this earlier? So he grasped me up, it's like Matt said it wasn't very good. <laughs> so, uh, so there you go. There I'm not you very go. good judge. It's a well, learning, look, it's a learning I've got, process. I've uh, got, back in 1994, Cross Rhythms uh, magazine wrote this. Matt Redman is planning to record an album next year. It's always very encouraging to see fresh, young songwriters with good material getting the breaks they deserve. Maybe in a year or two, we'll all be standing in church singing songs from this album instead of Shine, Jesus, Shine. <laughs> well, you know when you started writing songs, Matt, obviously you didn't know that churches would begin singing them. Uh, no, but obviously, yeah. wh wh which, was, which song actually kind of got known that introduced you as a lead worshipper? Um, there was a couple of early songs, I Will Offer Up My Life, uh, was one of them, uh, particularly here in the UK, and then uh, a song called Once Again, which is all about the cross. Those two. Uh, I think one of the songs that really, um, there, was, there was a fresh stirring all around the world. There was a lot of new worship music coming through, and, and, and the song Heart of Worship. Um, I think that might be one that kind of broke out a little further, and uh, it just, I think it kind of stumbled, a, well, that sounds a bad way to say it, but just wrote a song about something God seemed to be doing at the time. It has a, How, where were you in your own life at that time? How, did that song come out of something? Yeah, and very much out of what was happening at Soul Survivor Watford. We'd always spent a lot of time in the services and a big focus on worshipping God together through music. And, and, um, but it, Mike Pastor felt like, Pilavachi felt like we'd 
lost something, you know, of our, in our approach. Somehow over the little while, there was, there was something missing that was, used to be there. And he felt like maybe it had become more of a consumer spectator thing. People are like judging this worship leader out of ten or... I like this style, I don't like that style, that's not my favourite song, so I'm not going to sing that so heartily, and all those kind of dynamics. So he did a super brave thing and said, we're going to ban the band, take away the sound system, and just for a while, get in a room with our hearts and voices and our Bibles, and just check that with all the props not there, we can still bring an offering to God. Yes. And so the song just describes what happened. It says, when the music fades, all is stripped away, I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless your heart. Uh, I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you've required. You search much deeper within, uh, and it goes on to say, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And the funny thing was, I didn't even know if it was a congregational song. I thought it was my little description of what happened. And uh, we would, I remember Mike and I chatting about that and decided we'd lead it. And it, it just took off in the church, but like I say, maybe not in exactly the same way, but around the world, something was happening. People were starting to think a lot about gathered worship and yes. um, about what you know, moving on in that and uh, in expression of that and going deeper in that and coming back to make Jesus you know, all about Jesus. So that I guess the timing of it, you kind of started flying around a bit. Yes. Now you you actually went off to university. Uh, what, yes. what did you study at university? Psychology. Psychology. Yeah. Um, and then you... Um, well, I only did a year. You dropped out. Well, that's one way of saying it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you um, and Bill Gates have got something in common. <laughs> yeah. And uh, So you did a year, and then what? Did you feel, hey, look, I, I just don't want to be studying psychology. I want to be... I was kind of having a good time, because I was studying psychology. I had a lot of free time. And I became like the social uh, guy organising all the social stuff. And um, I'm not sure that's what you go to university for, but I was having a really good time. But they would, I did my first year and they're just about to start Soul Survivor Watford, the church plant. Same time, I think they were short of a worship leader at, here at St Andrews. And, um, you know, I, I, I just started to wonder if there's any way I could hang around for these exciting things and not go back and... So uh, with David and Mary Pitchers and Mike, we had some big discussions and um, me kind of on the floor begging, please let me stay. And uh, in the end, it was me, Mary and Mike begging David. And, uh, <laughs> he kind of uh, caved in in the end. So uh, he, he said I could have a year out. And I, I'm 37 now, I'm still on my year out. So <laughs> thanks, David. So you, you joined the staff here at St Andrews initially? Yes. As, as the yeah. worship leader? Yeah, musical director. Musical director, I'm sorry. Musical director. But I can't actually read music, so I used to get you a kick out of You can't read that. music? No, not at Do all. you not need to read music to do your job? I hope not. <laughs> 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 yeah. So you do it all by chords? Yeah, just surround myself with people who know what they're doing. Yeah, that's very <laughs> good. And then you, uh, with Mike, uh, went off and planted Soul Survivor. Yes. And you were the lead worshipper yeah, there. there at the same time that was a great adventure it's nothing more fun or scary than looking around a room and there's like 11 of you and you're thinking like you know you know all the people you're like how is this going to happen i mean one of them's mike you know <laughs> how on earth is this going to happen we we know who we are we're just normal people we've got to plant the church into this community and um it's a great it's a thrilling kind of adventure and and uh, mm. god I think God loves looking around at that room in that moment, yeah. just thinking, right, you wait and see. So uh, it was, yeah, brilliant adventure. And then when, I mean, obviously the Lord blessed uh, that church plant and it's thriving today. Yeah. Uh, but you're a little bit of a pioneer, aren't you? So once well, I'm not you, really, actually. In my not, personality, not at all. But, but, um, but, you, but you kind of get something going and then you move on. Well, partly it's my wife's more of a pioneer than me. Really? And I, um, yeah, she, she, gets, she always gets the vision about a year before I do, you know, and she knows what's going to happen. And I've yeah. learned to submit to that. Yes. But then you, <laughs> you went down south to help with a church plant. Yeah, we, we, um, we went and uh, helped plant a church called The Point in Mid-Sussex. Yes. Again, just a great adventure. It was about the same number of people. It yeah. was uh, a couple of great pastors called Will and Caroline Kemp and uh, 
who we'd known a while, and it was my two sisters and my mum, and there was about 11 of us, and again, just seeing what God can do with those little loaves yeah. of fish like he always did, and it was brilliant. And then you went to America to plant a church. Yeah, that's slightly different. That, that you know, uh, we were in the south in Atlanta, and um, I, the pastor, Louis Giglio, I guess he's been in that area a lot, and it's known a lot, and invested there a lot. So the first week there was 3,000 people. So that's a whole different thing. It's, it's actually not less challenging. It's just a whole different set of challenges, you know. Um, and were those 3,000 mainly Christian? Well, that's one of the challenges, trying to figure that out, you know. Who, is, who, like, who just likes being on church on a Sunday and who is counting themselves as a disciple of Jesus? You know, it's pretty interesting. Um, Isn't it? But they, they're on a great adventure. We were with them for two years, and it, it's, it's really great. You know, it's... Um, there's a lot of huge churches out yeah. there, but there's a lot of people who don't know Jesus. So yeah. I love it, all these you know, different flavours springing up all yeah. over the place, and it's great. And now, and then you move from there. You are a little bit nomadic. Yes, we are, definitely nomadic. But I'm just saying, I don't think I'm a pioneer. No. <laughs> yeah. And then now you're um, we in are, Brighton. Yeah, uh, a, a church called St Peter's, which is HTB's first church plant outside of London. And they've got this old cathedral-like build, building yes. you would have probably seen right in the yeah. heart of Brighton. You kind of have to go past it, uh, in and out of the city. And uh, the vision is that it wouldn't just become the directions on the route, like turn left at St. Peter's, or, but it actually become the destination. We want a whole lot more people to come there and find Jesus. And it's, um, again, a whole different adventure. I, I love the church planting thing because you, you just... Uh, it's just so many shapes and forms, but uh, so many different challenges. But, you know, there's something about stepping out in faith. I'm 37. I don't see God letting me down so far. You know, we, mm. we've taken some risk, you know, risky moments, I think, and moving around and a few different things. And we've got five kids. You've got school places to think about, all these different things, moving country twice in two years. But his faithfulness, is, uh, he has an amazing track record. And this, that once, you, once you taste that, not just in church planting, but in the life of faith in general. You can't really go back. It just bo it's boring afterwards, isn't it? If you know, you, you have to continue like that. You do, really. God, could you sing us one of your songs, Matt, and yeah. just tell us maybe the story behind it or yeah. uh, how you got to the point of putting it together? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll sing a little bit of Blessed Be Your Name, but, um, partly because the timing, uh, you know, we're here today and... Um, this was written really shortly after 9-11. We were living in California on sabbatical, and, um, and uh, it's just an interesting time to be out there, traveling around all these different churches. Yes. And um, I thought the preachers were doing a great job, actually. Yeah. You know, they were speaking about the compassionate heart of God, the sovereignty of God, control. They were just speaking some good stuff, and they, there's a lot of people out there flocking to church who weren't normally in church but I was thinking where are the songs you know this mm -hmm. what do you sing at a time like this and that felt a little odd to me partly because like that would be a really good thing to do right now to have some more vocabulary you know how do we talk to God in this moment but also I felt like but it, not only is it thoroughly relevant it's thoroughly biblical and we you know we talked a lot about that theme um, you know at Soul Survivor and different places just this whole thing of um, songs of trust through the storm and songs of lament. And, uh, and I think uh, it's definitely one of the kind of colors that we need to have in our, in our worship spectrum. And so partly thinking about that, partly being out there and such a crazy time in, in a nation and kind of feeling the heartbeat of God and the heartbeat of the nation. It, this, this song, Blessed Be Your Name, poured out pretty soon mm -hmm. after. And um, you can tell we didn't write it in England because it's, uh, I'll sing a bit of the second verse. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me. <laughs> We're out there in California. Top up the tan, Lord. You know, to your glory. And, uh, good. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me. When the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. With suffering, though it's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. 
when the dark discloses in law, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Wow. I, uh, there's a great film, Matt, Soul Surfer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, it is a really good movie. And uh, with Helen Hunt and Dennis Quaid, and it's a true story. And in that movie, the family are Christian and they go to church and then they sing your song. Yeah, it's great. They're on the beach in Hawaii. Yeah. The little ukuleles, it's great. Yeah. Have you seen the movie? Yeah, yes, uh, yeah. So when you saw them singing your song on this Hollywood movie, it must have felt a little bit surreal. Um, yeah, it was a little surreal. Um, it, I guess because when you write the songs, you're thinking about congregations and you're not thinking about, you know, it's going to end up in a movie. But it was, it was, they did a really good job of it. It's wonderful. They put a big part of the song. Uh, mm. And uh, I guess maybe lyrically it, it uh, tied into what happens later in yeah. the movie. So yeah. it's great. Yeah. Now, over the years, Matt, you've put together a number of different albums, and uh, your most recent album is 10,000 Reasons. Yes. So why did you call it 10,000 Reasons? Well, there's a lyric in one of the songs. It says, um, for all your goodness, I will keep on singing 10,000 reasons for, for my heart to find. And what I love about that is about, you know, about any, if you said that about anyone else apart from God, that would just be a complete load of, you know, it's just hyperbole and overstatement. And, but when you say that about God, there's 10,000 reasons. That's a complete understatement. It's a poetic understatement of the truth. There's many, many more than that. And it's just, yeah, a, sure. um, I guess the point of it is, um, you know, that he's just so utterly worthy. And, it, you know, you, we've got the, the reasons for his praise flying at us every day from every imaginable angle, um, be it looking at how he's made you, looking at what he's done in this world, looking at his, uh, what he's done through history. I mean, just studying the holiness of who he is or the grace of who he is. I mean, there's just, you just once you get into it, you just can't stop. And I wanted the, the, uh, you know, the song and the album to reflect a little bit of that. Matt, what would you say to people who are finding life quite discouraging at the moment, maybe even despairing, uh, with all that they're trying to cope with in their lives? Yeah, I think I'd say, you know, a huge part of the worshipping life is trust. And it's one thing, you know, um, when everything's going well, but I think some of, the, some of the times that define us most are when things aren't going well. And so you might be walking through a moment of discouragement or distress or even despair right now. Um, but the funny thing is the very best thing you could do right now is to... to uh, believe in God as who he is, almost take your eyes off yourself and look at him. And, and there's something about, um, you know, trusting God's always going to involve unanswered questions, it's going to involve confusion. And that's part of the life of worship. That's part of the life of being a Christian. But like I say, that, those moments can, they can really mark us out. You know? yeah. and, and so if you're in that place right now, um, just don't underestimate trust. Don't underestimate there's not many things in life you should put all your eggs in one basket, but when it comes to Jesus, you definitely should. should. You know, and, and that means, uh, you know, that means being all in, even in those moments of despair. Like, I don't get this, God. Like I said earlier, when I was talking about sure. my story, I don't understand a little piece of this, but something in me knows that you're greater uh, than than this situation. That you're just as in control as you were before the situation. That you're just as loving and kind and merciful. Uh, as you were before the situation, and so I'm, I'm still all in, I'm still going to trust. And I, I don't think that sometimes that means everything clears up straight away, and you know, sometimes, you know, situations move on, sometimes you're, you're in a painful thing for a long time, but even though the situation hasn't changed, something in you's changed. Yeah. There's something about that worshipping gaze on God, it changes your whole way you look at life, your whole perspective, and uh, it's good for your soul. Yeah. I was um, uh, recently uh, on a train going to Edinburgh 
and um, I was uh, listening to your 10,000 Reasons. I had my earphones on and uh, oh, I was crying and I was listening, listening, and then I started singing it out loud. And then Killy said to me, stop it! <laughs> and um, um, uh, Mike Plavacci, you and I were talking about your album and, and it's interesting that um, he said that, that there was one song in there, one song in there that really moved him. And, and I said, yes, there's one song in there, there's one song that moved me. And it was two different songs. <laughs> uh, but uh, I text you on the train and I said, I want that song uh, sung at my funeral. And um, we can talk about a theme. Yeah, yeah. we can. Do, <laughs> so I'm kidding. I know. So before, before um, do you want, do you I have the, it sung uh, at my funeral, do you think you could sing it now? Yeah, and, I could. But at your funeral, just to be clear, do you want like a full Greek, like bazooki? Yes, and all that? I do. I do. I want all of that, you know? Yeah. So uh, could you like maybe sing part of the song that Mike liked and then part of the song that okay. I liked? And maybe, what, what's the story behind those two songs, Matt? Um, this, I was singing a bit of Never Once, I was singing a chorus, uh, well, yeah. a verse and a chorus of that, and that, that's a song about God's faithfulness. It, it's actually, um, we were in, I was in an empty house in Atlanta, we'd left, all flown home, all our stuff's back in England, and I went back to our house there, and it's totally empty, and it's just me there, and I had my guitar, and I just started thinking about God's faithfulness, about the scars along the way, the struggles, but also the victories and, um, you know, just the whole thing of all that transition and not even knowing where we were going to be now. And it just, yeah. it, it, you know, it, I was just reminded never once have I walked a, you know, a step alone. And uh, so that's where the song came from. Standing on this mountain top, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us, kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory is your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way. But with joy our hearts can say Yes, our hearts can say Never once did we ever walk alone Never once did you leave us on our own You are faithful, God, you are faithful So you want a bit of endless hallelujah? Yeah. Okay. What, how did you end up writing that one? Um, let me bring my keys go out, Sam, because this is a this Thanks. one's a whole lot better with Sam. Piano, isn't it? Um, this was a real team effort, actually, because um, some of the music in it uh, actually a, uh, a really good friend of mine sent me a guy called Tim Wanstall. It just has a wonderful sense of melody and chords, and yeah. that was pretty inspiring. Then I came across this. Um, him by a guy called Robert McChaney in 1837 yeah. uh, when this passing world is uh, done I think it's called and just some of the lyrics I thought oh, um, well, here's the thing right if they've been you know dead a little while you sometimes can sure. like steal their lyrics and it's okay <laughs> you know it's good it's a pretty good thing because you know even like in the, I always say with the Bible like you can um kind of plagiarise the Psalms. Instead of yeah. getting sued, you actually get encouraged. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. so, well, it's all, it's all Holy Spirit copyright, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But it's the same, some of the hymns have kind of gone out, you know, they're so old that it's a similar thing. And I just found some of these lyrics so inspiring and they kind of threw me uh, into this song and I ended up two other people involved, a Swedish guy called Jonas Marin and an uh, American called Chris Tomlin. So yeah. we ended up being like a, yeah. Two Brits, a Swede, an American, and a dead guy writing a song together. <laughs> so uh, it was excellent. And um, a song about yeah, heaven, a song about w worship in heaven. Uh, yeah, play a bit. Mm -hmm. 
it at my funeral. <laughs> Very moving, a really inspiring Matt. How, how, would you, how would you describe Jesus? Um, I think that's, a, that's a great question. I mean, just from a personal level, everything to me. I don't spend a day not thinking about him. I, and, uh, you know, I believe him to be the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things. Um, I believe him to be the one holding everything together and that includes our lives, that includes our little messes and struggles and strifes and um, I believe he's the one true God, he's eternal, he's the God of yesterday, today and forever and um, kind of staking my life upon it. Matt, you really, I, I mean I, I, I think that you're a, a modern day prophet who's um, conveying uh, the truth of God uh, for today's generation. And um, you know, my prayer is that you'll just keep on writing songs, singing songs, and helping the church to sing new songs um, about him and to him. Thank you very much. Matt Redden. Thank you. 